because like the rest of you, I normally do a lot of travel. So this location is about 30 minutes down the road from where our office is located, which is great. And of course, this morning I woke up, threw open the curtains in my hotel room and went, oh, great, it's sunshiny out. So it's not going to last long for those of you not from here. So make sure you take a moment and actually kind of take a view. If you've not looked out the back of this window out here, you can see one of the most perfect views of Chicago. So take in a moment, right? when you can and appreciate kind of the viewpoint. Um, I think the other thing that happened when I threw open my windows is there was this big Coca-Cola truck sitting right outside down below and I thought, yes, great way to caffeinate for the day. So for those of you that know me, I'm a huge Coca-Cola fan. So I'm actually gonna start out today really by talking about the world right as we know it today. Um, when you think about any time there's over a billion consumer-facing products in the world, it actually changes, right, how we operate in a pretty significant way. So when you kind of look back in time, you've got things like cars, fixed-line TV, fixed-line telephones, TVs, PCs, all of them have had a huge profound effect on society, right, and smartphones are going to be no exception. We're anticipating that there's going to be 3 billion of them worldwide by 2017, over a quarter of those in the U.S. Already, right, two in three people in the U.S. own a, start, a smartphone. And just think it was only seven years ago, and I find that amazing, that the iPhone was actually introduced. So that was 2007. Feels like it was just yesterday. Um, it wasn't the first smartphone, right, but it's not by now uh, the most popular. Um, and widely owned. And before the iPhone, right, we didn't even know what an app was. And interestingly enough, we now spend over 60% of our time on our smartphones in mobile apps. So I think it's also important to keep in mind we've really crossed over a quite significant milestone this summer. So globally, we surpassed 100% mobile line penetration. So really put in simple terms, that means we now have more mobile lines than consumers or than people. That's really profound, right, if you stop and think about it for just a little bit. So connectivity and smart device proliferation, they're having a profound impact, right, on our consumer tendencies. And we're moving from a world where commerce actually happens in a very explicit, right, well-defined location to a world where commerce ultimately can happen anytime anywhere and across any device. So as a result of mobility and ubiquitous connectivity, right, consumer preferences are really starting to change. And that's really much different from the, what we were doing even just three or four years ago. So mobile preferences are rising while traditional channels are falling out of fashion. And anyone who looks at mobile now as an alternative channel, right, you're really in for an unpleasant surprise in the future. So just looking at some of these stats, right? Talking on the telephone, it's actually down by 34%. Now I'm just curious, how many people here still own a home telephone? Because I don't, I actually finally get, so we're probably 50-50. So I think that says quite a bit. Reading email is down by 25%. And like Bill, I celebrate that fact. Email's not my strength. I tell my team all the time I'm waiting for the day I can actually turn it off. You know oh, excellent. <laughs> Um, when you look at smartphone growth, where is the growth or usage, where is the growth actually happening? So 8% of it is actually talking on the phone. So funny we still call them smartphones, right? Only 8%. But when you look at things like browsing on the web, texting, live chat, mobile self-service, they're all growing at a much faster pace and they're actually growing at double digit growth. So consumers are increasingly viewing, right, kind of these alternative channels, as we used to call them, as their de facto channels for the interactions that they have with your business. And in fact, mobile is now really becoming the preferred channel. So what's that mean? Retailers must begin to improve their experiences in these channels, right? Or you're going to lose out to others who already have or will do. So keep in mind that transposing what worked online, right, doesn't necessarily translate to mobile. That's an insufficient kind of link to make. Mobile is really a fundamentally different channel, and it requires really thinking about creating very unique and new experiences. 
And it really comes down to simplicity, right? That's key. So I might only have five minutes while I'm standing in line, right? Maybe ordering my morning coffee or tea. That five minutes, right, is time where you have the ability to actually interact with your consumer. And if you can actually transact with your consumer within that five minute time span, you win. So I'm just gonna use a quick example of Discover for a real quick second. We have 5% quarterly programs that you actually have to register for. It used to be in order to register, you had to pick up the phone and you had to call us. So you had to go online, right, and actually get into the browser enabled function and sign up for it. Now, you actually can text us, you can get an email, click on a link, or you can go into the mobile app and register directly. All very simple and easy. So when we look at today's reality, right, it's really in opposition to in innovation. And so when we talk about all this technology, really easy for me to stand up here and say, right, much, much harder for all of us to do. And this isn't gonna be a cakewalk. So few retailers really have the advantage of looking at mobile or any other channel, right, for that matter, with a clean slate. So Uber, Airbnb, and others all grew up in what I call a mobile first world. So that's their advantage, right? We've got other advantages as retailers. However, when it comes to technology, most of us don't have that clean slate, right? We've grown up in a world that's rooted in very rigid systems, we have on-premise hardware, we have lack of API exposure, or even understanding what it is, and we're standing on what we now call or what is thought of as legacy technology. So existing infrastructure, right, is really the reality, and mobile has to find a way to kind of navigate either through it or around it. What we currently understand on things around technical implementation, right, we have to do things in very deliberate steps. We have to have a definitive answer um, pathway of where we're going. We need to have very specific details, right, drawn out in order for us to get there. We have to think about where we can be most impactful, right, and we execute on those initiatives first. And some of that is very valid, right, as you kind of move into the new digital space of the world today. But what we really have to start thinking about is really what's your ROM, which is your return on mobility. We have to start moving more directionally, right, a little less specific. It's very difficult, but you have to really imagine the future. I'm a very big fan of TED Talks, so for any of the rest of you that might be, you've probably seen Dan Gilbert's presentation. And I'm going to try to summarize his 20 minutes in about two seconds here. He talks a lot about um, what he references as we are willing as consumers, right, to overpay for the opportunity to indulge in our current preferences. And he discovered this through research, so let me give you the example he uses. He talks about imagining kind of your favorite uh, band or concert that you would like, that you really enjoy today and think about and come up with a dollar amount, right, of what you would pay for that band into the future. Most people came up with an average of $120. He then, on a separate question, said, now think backwards, right? Think about the band you loved 10 years ago. How much would you pay to go see them in concert today? And interestingly enough, the average is $80, right? So in kind of a normal rational world, those things would be equal, but they're not. So why is that? And what he really references is that we overestimate their stability. And I think that's a really important point. So what does that really mean for us in business? It means we're really willing to overinvest, right, in technology and things that we understand today because we assume it's going to carry us into the future. And why is that? So it's as I referenced, right, the ease of remembering is much easier than the difficulty of imagining the future. So most of us can look back and remember who we were 10 years ago, right? But it's really difficult to imagine who we as a person are going to be in the future. So we mistakenly think, right, because it's hard to imagine, it's not likely to happen. So when people say things, right, it's I can't imagine, they're usually talking more about their own lack of imagination versus the actual unlikelihood of the event that they're describing. So it's only when we look backwards, right, that we can realize how much change has happened in a decade, and now we know how important it is 
that we need to appreciate how much change now is going to happen right as we look forward for the next decade. And despite all these infrastructure challenges that we have, retailers must have the creative capacity to look five or more years down the road. And you have to imagine, and even though it's difficult to conceive right today, what is reality? So think about an ideal state, consider the steps to get there, start moving directionally, not specifically. Don't let infrastructure limitations hinder your vision for the future. And that's really important, and again, as I started, it's very hard. But inevitably, right, infrastructure is refreshed, and it does change. I always say, our IT department, they can build anything. The only two things, it's money or time, and those are kind of the harder pieces, but it will happen. So we need to start planning for tomorrow's reality now, and we have to live in a constant state of beta. So let's just take a moment and actually turn to the consumer. Our understanding of the consumer today, right, is quite siloed. We really lack a very holistic 360 degree view. And a lot of that is due, right, to our existing infrastructure, which has really produced what I would call kind of a lack of cross-channel visibility. You know, you know who I am, right, when I'm online. You know who I am when I'm on mobile. You may not know that I'm actually the same individual. And when I actually walk into your store, in many cases, you have no idea who I am. I'm a very unknown entity to you in your location. So when you have a channel-specific view of the customer, it's actually somewhat useless, right? It's like trying to envision what else is outside this picture from the view that you can currently see. So consumers don't think of us in terms of channels. And again, Bill referenced that in his, his talk as well. They really think about, right, what's best or easiest or simplest for them, in particular today, right, at a given time and place, because commerce can happen anywhere. And if you're unable to satisfy those needs and understand how that shopper interacts with your brand as a whole, right, what kind of message are you sending as your business? So for the purposes of kind of illustrating this, I've created a fictional character, and I'm going to call this gentleman David. David, more than likely, right, interacts with a retailer with all three different channels, right, whether it be online, mobile, or in-store. However, um, and, and this is really, right, in regards to his path to making a decision, although most retailers actually don't realize it, because, again, we can only see one versus all three together. And because we can't realize that, right, additional points of friction then end up in the system and opportunities to actually close the sale start to become overlooked or they're actually missed. So let's kind of start with David in kind of an all too familiar scenario because I think we've all been here, right? While at home, David starts his day and he's searching for a new HDTV and he's on an e-commerce website of a large retailer, technology retailer, and he's really looking at, right, price, features, specs, all the stuff we can find online. It's Wednesday, and of course he wants the TV by Saturday because it's the opening game of his big college football team. Now, the retailer doesn't know this because they haven't asked. David's been a loyal uh, customer to this retailer, shopping at their brick and mortar locations quite frequently. But because this is the first time he's actually been on their e-commerce website, the retailer actually doesn't have an understanding of, his ex of their res existing relationship. So to the retailer, right, David doesn't exist and hasn't up to this point. So let's continue on down the day. David now goes to work and he's at lunch. And he decides, you know what, I'm going to pick up my tablet while I'm go having lunch and I'm going to continue my search for my TV. So through all the research, right, that he did before, as he's now looking on his tablet, he's found he has to start again because the retailer wasn't able to make the jump from what he was doing online onto his tablet. So David, obviously frustrated, has to waste time getting back to the point he already was at this morning to that comparison point of the various TVs that he was actually looking to purchase. And clearly his excitement, right, at purchasing of this retailer is starting to diminish slightly. So he also notices he can't tell if the TVs are at a local store near his area. So, and part of that is due to the fact that the retailer's not even asked what his store location is. 
So at one point, David actually looks through his t you know, comparison TVs, and he puts one in his shopping cart. He actually takes a moment and thinks, you know, maybe I should just buy this now. But because he has to fill out different, 20 different lines of data and put his credit card information in, and he's on only a 15-minute lunch break, right? He chooses to say, I'll do this later, because it appears to be a little bit more of a daunting task that he wants to take on at lunch. So now we fast forward to the next day, and David decides, I'm going to the store. So he shows up at the brick and mortar location, and he's hoping to view the products he has identified now online in person. And I think we've all been there, right? And our intent at this point, just like David's, is to actually make a purchase. So there's many associates roaming around the store, and in fact, some of them are off talking over off to the side. Um, so David ends up trying to navigate his way through the store, finds the TV section, which in many stores today isn't hard to find because there's like 80 of them, right, and they're humongous. Um, but he also, as he's browsing through, starts to get frustrated again because he can't find two of the five TVs, right, that he's narrowed a search down to actually in the store. So he takes a moment, walks around the store, tries to find an associate who, of course, doesn't know David because he doesn't know he's been on their e-commerce or the mobile website, and he doesn't really know what his needs are. So after David now for the third time has explained to your business why he's there, the associate says, hmm, just a minute, I'll have to go find out. And what does he do? He disappears off to the back room. So, David now standing there as we normally do, gets quite impatient, and about a minute later he's whipped out his mobile phone. And so he's sitting there browsing away, and he decides, you know what, I think I'm just gonna go look on Amazon and see what they've got. And he starts reading about the TVs that he had been viewing previously. Again, now five minutes has passed, the associate's still in the back room, and so he decides, you know what, after reading these customer reviews, I can get some opinions on what I maybe should buy. I've got some recommendations. He actually purchases the TV on the spot with one-click checkout. And, of course, because he's a Prime member, it shows up at his house tomorrow because he's guaranteed delivery. So, because Amazon knows David as a customer and he knows what customers like him tend to buy, they also then offer up a Blu-ray DVD player and a surround sound system, all at a discount for buying the package with set for $75 less. So, of course, what's David now do as he's walking out the store? He tweets about this fabulous experience he's just now had with Amazon. So, unfortunately, right, I think this type of experience is all too common for us today. And retailers really are missing out on valuable opportunities and they're losing sales as a result. But Clearly, that's all soon to change. So really think about how much better the experience could have been, right, if that retailer could have made the connections of all those channels as that one consumer together. And by the way, right, look at how much nicer the view is when you can see the whole thing. So generally, because we do, or retailers do miss that holistic understanding of the customers, right, uh, the consumer, customers are really starting to take some of this into their own hands. And the sales floor has really become Amazon's showroom, which is exactly what you don't want. So shoppers like David, they're connected, they're empowered. And they're using devices in stores, right, to help improve their shopping experience because they can't get what they're seeking when they're actually at the retailer's location. And they're not feeling that it's a compelling experience when they're there. So let's just take a quick moment, right? I always say, take things back to the basics. Why do I actually come into your store? Well, one, I come in because I want to see it. I want to touch it. I want to feel it. I want to look with my own eyes. Does plasma look better than LCD? Or does LCD look better than plasma? How does that feel when I'm actually standing in front of it? Two, I actually need help. I need somebody who's more knowledgeable, right, than what I can find on the internet. Because I'm pretty smart, so I can do my homework. And it's maybe not so much knowledge, but it's how to interpret that knowledge. Especially with all the technology today, you're given stats and data and features, and you need somebody, right, to help digest that information and explain to you what it actually means when you're watching TV or whatever other electronic device you might be buying. Third, I'm looking for opinions. I'm seeking information, right, that's based on data, product specs, details, what's happening in your returns department. Are there faults, right, with maybe one specific piece of this device? 
what happens on the service and the repair side of the business. That's information, right, that you have available that you could push out to your front floor. Four, I want a recommendation, right? It's one of the key things that we come in for is to have that conversation and to have somebody actually say to you, based on what I've heard from you today, this is what you should actually be purchasing. And five, I'm there because I want it now. I don't want it three weeks from now, I want it now. So, but because retailers have really failed to deliver, right, on that compelling and amazing in-store experience, utilizing, and I'm gonna use the word omni-channel <laughs> experience, because that is how we've all become referenced to it, mobile's really now become a threat, right? And that's not good. Um, blocking cell phone signals, putting in proprietary barcodes, those are not the types of actions you should be taking towards your business, right? A hostile view towards mobile actually just makes, your, makes consumers your enemy. If David had actually been approached by a knowledgeable associate who had a thorough understanding of his needs, who understood their inventory right there in front of him, there's a very good chance that David would have purchased in that store and would have not felt compelled, right, to pull out his device and actually do the opposite, which was purchasing elsewhere. So it is really critical that retailers view this as an opportunity. So customers are actually uh, rapidly evolving. And today's shopper is dramatically different, right, from the shopper four or five years ago. There's fundamental shifts in behavior that are occurring, and there's three new demands, right, that have come to the forefront. It's simplicity, context, and immediacy. Several years ago, and maybe it was even as much as recently last year, these were nice to haves, and they are no longer, they are now need to haves. So companies with strong vision around mobility and really consumer behavior continue to raise, right, that proverbial bar for everybody. How many retailers actually are delivering experiences on par with companies like Uber, Airbnb, Hotel Tonight, or Amazon? Almost none. So the average consumer doesn't really understand, right, why, tradition, why traditional brick and mortar retailers can't keep up with that. The fact that it's hard to merge our channels, that we have integrated systems in the back end that we have to integrate, really means nothing to those shoppers. It's a moot point. So if I go to your store and it's not in stock, I want you to order it for me. And I want, or I want you to tell me where I can actually go get it right now in a nearby facility. So retailers must develop these experiences that address these new expectations or they're going to risk losing their consumers to their competitors and those that actually can create the right experience. The key is to make sure that you package, right, all three of these elements together into one unified offering. So let's go back to our example of David. And I'm really just gonna kind of walk through a list of questions really around developing, right, the experience that could have addressed each one of these items. And if they had been able to, right, the chance of deflection or losing that sale would have been greatly reduced. So things like, why didn't the retailer ask when David needed the product? Or based on location, why didn't they show him what TVs were in stock at what locations? Why didn't they have a mobile optimized checkout flow with one tap purchasing? They could have actually addressed, right, the immediacy of the situation that David was standing, where David was standing. Why didn't they leverage his desktop searches when he actually continued on his search in mobile later that day? His mobile experience could have been optimized, right, saving him quite a bit of time in obtaining the same information, right? He had to go through that whole process again. Why wasn't he guided into the TV section, right, using an in-store navigation on his mobile app? They could have actually increased the simplicity of when he walked in that door of interacting with the brand. Why didn't the retail identify David as he walked into the store? Help guide him to the TVs, right, exact location within the TV department of what he was looking to view based on what he had been looking at on his mobile device. A beacon could have identified him and sent his unique customer profile to an associate with a client telling MPAWS solution. And he could have been approached, right, right on the spot. Or better yet, he could have actually scheduled time in advance to meet one of your associates at that store 
who's an expert on TVs and who could really be very knowledgeable, right, in assisting David talk through his purchasing decisions. They could have provided a much better contextual experience. But without an understanding across all the channels, our chances actually to boost your satisfaction and increase the likelihood of closing the sale are almost always missed. So a couple additional data points to kind of bear in mind in addition to these topics, right? Two and three consumers, they want to be connected to the web at all times. 44% of consumers actually find mobile shopping apps very difficult to use. And one in four consumers don't actually want to put in credit card information on mobile devices or all that additional data. Too time consuming. So there's definitely an opportunity, right, to stream our checkout process. So let's think about mobile across the consumer or the customer life cycle. This becomes a very holistic view, right, that you have to take on. You can't think about, the, about mobile in context of a particular product, a department, um, or an initiative. You have to think about the role mobile actually plays in the customer's life cycle and the entire journey. There's really four critical phases outlined here that can hap help you, right, re-engage with your consumer throughout the entire process. So let's talk about acquiring, right? What if after David's desktop search, he had seen a retargeting ad on his mobile device for a TV he had been viewing while reading the news? What if by the, on his way to work, he actually hit a geofence and he was pushed an offer for 10% if he actually purchased the TV that he had in his shopping cart that day? You could help serve your customers better. While in the store, right, David could have paged a shopping consultant via a mobile self-service station which had been placed at the entrance. Or again, as I had mentioned previously, he could have scheduled a time in advance. And not days in advance, right, but within hours. How about as a result of Beacon technology, he could have been greeted by his first name upon entering the store by an associate who had knowledge of his, you know, searching patterns. Or he could have been pushed a notification that guided him into the TV section. Could have notified, right, that John the Associate's gonna meet you over in the TV department and help talk you through these five TVs that it appears you were interested in. Now, I will stop for a moment and say, there's a little bit of a creepiness factor we all have to keep in, in mind. Um, I know it feels a little like maybe too many people are watching you too closely. So you do need to make sure that the consumers that you engage in these manners they understand that that's what you're doing and that they're willing to actually step into that and be engaged in that manner. So let's go back to nurturing, right? You could have let him pay with credit card loyalty points or at a 5% discount. Or what if the retailer's loyalty program could have provided him a 15% discount on a bundled offering, right? If he had bought three or four additional products. Or maybe it has nothing to do with the transaction that happens at that time. It could be that you actually reach out to him, whether it be text or by phone, to actually contact that individual to say, hey, we're having a private sale. Why don't you come in and look at these new DVD players? Or it could be other related merchandise. Or maybe you happen to know that his washing machine might need to be replaced soon, and you want to bring him back into the store for that reason, which had nothing to do right, with that TV purchase. Or you could look at growing the business, right? If the sales associate who had had a client telling device knew David's search behavior on the web, and he could have actually upsold him potentially, right, to that TV that he kept going back to, but ultimately the price was too expensive. But being able to talk him through why those features could have been important to buy that better TV might have actually gotten an upsell. You really want your associates to be, right, a facilitator of engagement or become that trusted advisor on your merchandise. Or bring gamification into your store, right? We all talk about it being online, but maybe, you know, once somebody buys a TV or some merchandise in your store, right, they could spin to win something additional, right? They're there. Helps, helps celebrate their purchase. If they win something, they can even celebrate further in the store with your associates and it might actually create future interest in a game, driving behavior right back into a different channel that you're seeking to get their interaction on. 
And yes, some of these scenarios seem futuristic, but they're really actually not. And in fact, many of them are kind of operating out in the real world today. But each one of these little components, right, move us closer to that ideal state, kind of that imagine of, imagination of the future, one that's really oriented around the consumer, because in our mobile age today, our decisions have to be customer driven. So a lot of po positive change really can come from fundamentally, right, reimagining today what we know as point of sale. So let's just again take a quick moment and look and say, what does point of sale, right, kind of do for us today? It is very transactional, right? It's the point of sale. It can be the first, but it's definitely the last contact with the customer. The point of sale, it's about accepting a payment. It's about processing your customers through a queue. It really adds not a lot of value to the overall shopping journey. And it is absolutely, right, does not have the human element involved. We're actually replacing a lot of our kind of point of sale areas with self-checkouts. So with this model, right, retailers fail to play a really active role in the decisioning, the buying and the decisioning process because employees are really kind of what I'll call to be chained to the cash wraps and they're unable to become influential and they're, they're very far away, right, from that decisioning process because point of sale is after the buying decision has been made. So very passive in-store experience, in particular for the customers, and it can be quite frustrating, especially if you need help. And again, it really lacks that human element, which at the end of the day is what retailing is all about. So let's start moving to what I'll reference and reinvent kind of point of sale to being point of service. We want to make sure, right, we want to deliver a compelling and informed shopping experience for our customers. Unchain your employees from their cash wraps, arm them with mobile devices, and it's not about mobile devices that accept payment, and I know that says a lot coming from a payment company, but you need to make sure you provide things around your inventory and CRM. That's kind of the future of retail. Mobile checkouts actually, believe it or not, breed operational effic efficiencies, and they definitely enhance the in-store experience. It brings back the human element, right, which is what it's all about. Because if we take that technology, we can focus on really kind of three things that happen. You can empower your employees, you can make service more responsive, and you can increase your sales, which, as most businesses, is key. So. When we talk about empowering your employees, one of the things you want to make sure your employees have at their disposal, right, is at least as much product information as what's available online. And MPAWS actually can help trans transfer that into reality. So I'll use JCPenney or Best Buy Canada for ex instances. They both load and periodically, right, through their update, uh, or through their Wi-Fi in store, update training materials, product information, and they also provide product comparison tools directly onto the associates' MPOS devices. And this is accessible for them, right, as they're kind of traveling around the sales floor. It really arms their employees with a vast array of mobile knowledge, and then that way their employees can help their customers really make the right decision. Companies like Urban Outfitters are actually looking, they're using their mobile checkouts more around looking for out-of-stock merchandise. And really what they're able to do is look at kind of the three closest stores in vicinity to where they're currently located to find out if that, if another store is carrying the item that the customer is seeking. And by the way, if the customer decides, I don't want to drive that extra five miles down the road, they're actually able to ship it for free directly to the consumer's residence. So let's go back to David for just a brief moment. If the retailer had actually taken on these actions, provided their employees with the tools to help with inventory in his hands, right, would David actually left, or not even left, right, gone online and purchased from somewhere else? More than likely not because he would have been, the retailer would have been able to capture that transaction right on site. You need to make your service more responsive, right? So you need, so in traditional retail environments, some employees are designated to the sales floor, right? And others are actually over designated manning the registers. 
When you put MPOS into the environment, the two become irrelevant, right? There's not a distinction between those two functions. It gives employees the ability, right, to view inventory without abandoning the customer. And one of the best examples I can give you of this is Nordstrom's. So they actually are among a very small pool of retailers who've got a full inventory integration into their mobile point of sale or their mobile checkout application. And they've got over 6,000 devices deployed and obviously growing every day. As a byproduct of, um, of adding these MPOS uh, devices into your employees, right, your associates can start to build better rapport with their shoppers. They don't have to leave the customer's side. They're able to actually meet, greet, answer questions, and close the sale almost in the same exact location of where they started to interact with their customer. And then the last example I can give you around being more responsive in service is Microsoft is actually working with retailers to create what they call connected fitting rooms. Shoppers actually, through the fitting rooms, can request new sizes and items to try on right there. And then that sends a notification out to the associates on their MPOS devices. And then lastly, right, increasing sales. I've talked about engaging and building rapport and sharing out additional information, product upsells. These are all the types of experiences, right, that cannot be replicated online. And that's the key. Because if you're going to replicate what's online in your store, why do I need to come into your store? So Alex and Annie cited an increase in service by putting MPOS devices into their employees' hands as a key factor that contributed by 318% sales growth from their 211 to 212 holiday shopping season. We've also spoken to a large Midtel retailer which uses the inventory integration capabilities of their MPOS to really help fulfill kind of in-store orders, right, from locations where products actually are experiencing slow turnover. Ooh, that doesn't sound good. Um, so when we talk about mobile demands uh, continuing to increase, right, we're living in an age where this pace of demand is increasing and it's really skyrocketing. So the problem is that few retailers are really executing on these strategies, right, that, that talk about and address each of these areas. It's very compartmentalized and it's what I call a lot of spaghetti throwing which is going on and very few have united strategies. And strategy has to come first. Technology then follows. So the future is really about leveraging mobile as a linchpin, right, to marry various shopping-related services with payments to transition consumers into that integrated consumer experience. You can see signs we're all moving in the right direction, right? I'll use restaurants as the example, and it's really more on kind of that quick order. Lots of mobile order ahead, Panera Bread, Jamba Juice, right, Domino's, they're all making great waves in this space. It is about increasing convenience and about being respectful of your customer's time. Why aren't retailers actually allowing you to schedule appointments with in-store consultants? And again, not days ahead, but within hours of where I am in today. Why couldn't David have selected the TV he actually wanted ahead of time and then pulled up curbside, right, and picked it up at the store? There's lots of movement being held or being led today in the merchant wallet space. And again, it, it's centered around restaurants at the moment, but clearly MCX is set to change that significantly in retail. It really then becomes all about the data and closing in on that marketing loop. The better you're able to collect, kind of understand, repackage transaction data, the better experience you can actually provide. And if you can't do it yourself, find partners. Consumers are fairly willing to share information, just as long as they know what you're going to do with it, and you actually provide them something in return, which is key. So you really need to continue to find ways, right, to understand personal preferences. Don't bombard your shoppers with surveys. I don't know about you guys, but I'm starting to ignore them, because every time I walk anywhere, somebody sends me another survey. And I will have to say they're coming at quite a rapid pace within about five minutes of walking out. But slowly collect information over time, right? Gain an understanding of who that individual is. 
Make sure you understand the immediacy of what they're doing. Are they just browsing? Are they actually out to purchase? Learn about their brand preferences. We all have them. Make sure you understand them. There's also price tolerances, again, bands that we'll all live within, and it's different based upon the types of merchandise that we're looking at. So we're really not that far off, right, from a world where algorithms are gonna be leveraged to create more dynamic and unique shopping experiences. Facebook does that today, right? They're constantly watching us, they're applying that information over time, and they're using algorithms to provide us news feeds that are relevant to what we want to know and understand. And retailers have to be able to do this, right, with their online, their mobile experience, and hopefully transact that into the real world space. Dynamic, dynamic product placement and pricing are all very near term possibilities. So let's make sure that we transition from a world, right, where we're using mobile to do kind of old things in new ways. We've recently been just slapping a veneer on, but we need to really move to a world where we're taking mobile to deliver very new and revolutionary experiences. It's also important to note, as I've mentioned, right, don't take a build it and they will come scenario. You've got to have a strategy in place and you have to have a strategy to encourage that adoption. So I think this is a great quote to consider as we're kind of wrapping up and when we're thinking about technology and especially mobile commerce, right? We already have a window into our future. You hear things about mobile loyalty, offers, payments, and they're all appearing in the environment. They may be niche environments, but they are out there and we do see different markets starting to adopt different practices. It's not widespread, but inevitably, all of these items will reach mass market. So you can't win if you don't play. So you have to get in the game. And I can't emphasize that enough. So since it's football season, I am going to use the analogy, right? You have to actually get some plays going to get some first downs. And you have to head right in that general direction of the goal line. So sorry. Um, you have to then take that goal line, right? That's our imagined future that we've referenced. That's key because eventually, right, all those first downs in that general direction, they get us a touchdown. So I do want to say thank you for your time, and I hope you will enjoy the rest of the conference and Chicago if you have any time to get out.